Thank you all for your interest in our research on rusty blackbird population genomics. Before I get into my talk, I just want to acknowledge my co-authors, Rob Wilson, Steve Matsuoka, Luke Powell, Jim Johnson, and Dean Demarest, as well as uh, our collaborators, Terry, Paulson, Carol, Pam, Marion, Dave, Jay, and all of the biologists who assisted with the capture efforts. This could not have been done without you. Also, uh, just a quick plug-in, we're hosting a workshop on October 7th and 9th. So if you're interested, um, please register at the link below so that the organizers can uh, get you that Zoom link. So rusty blackbirds breed across the boreal biome from Alaska to Newfoundland and winter in the eastern half of the United States. Isotopes and band recovery indicate a general migratory divide, with birds breeding in the eastern boreal, generally migrating along the Atlantic flyway, to wintering areas along the Atlantic coastal plain, with uh, breeders from the western and central boreal migrating down the Mississippi flyway to the lower Mississippi alluvial valley. Rusty blackbirds have declined alarmingly over the last 40 years, and potential factors promoting this decline have been identified, which include loss of wetlands in the wintering areas, contaminants on the breeding grounds, and increased disturbance on boreal wetlands. Alone, none of these factors appear to be adequate to account for the market decline of the species, so we're likely witnessing synergistic effects. Further, with increased temperature associated with climate change, environmental mercury present in the boreal wetlands is expected to be released into the ecosystem, and this further, will further stress rusty blackbirds and other species occupying this region. So evaluations of response to changes in habitat and migratory species has an extra layer of complexity, as migration and events that occur during the non-breeding season, such as weather, disease, habitat quality, and nutrition, can affect an individual's body condition, survival, and fecundity, and ultimately the population dynamics of specific breeding populations. The influence of disruptions to breeding populations is dis difficult to assess as populations may not be equally affected by changes occurring on non-breeding areas, and that's especially true if populations are temporally or spatially segregated during the non-breeding portion of their annual cycle. So a first step to disentangling stressors that may be promoting decline in rusty blackbirds is to understand linkages among key stages in the life cycle. Ultimately understand how populations are connected across the landscape, both spatially and temporally. So while we have some information on the migratory connectivity of these species, greater spatial resolution is needed to link events and effects occurring on the non-breeding area to nesting areas. So further, data are limited regarding dispersal propensity and tendencies for the species. So there's no information on natal dispersal, but in the northeastern part of the United States, approximately 45% of the birds return to nesting areas between years. So we plan to apply methods that map allele frequencies across the nesting distribution and use models to assign birds sampled during the non-breeding portion of the annual cycle to breeding areas to examine spatial connectivity and aid in the identification of independent demographic units. So an example of this is in Yellow Warbler, where Christy, Kristen and her colleagues matched genetic variation across the landscape. And by assaying samples collected at different spatial as well as temporal periods, we're able to identify region-specific migratory routes and timetables of migration along the Pacific Flyway. So looking at this map, the different colors illustrate variation in allele frequencies across the breeding range. And then with the proportion of individuals assigned to breeding areas during different stages of the life cycle are shown by arrows for stopover sites and then circles for the wintering areas. So the aim of our project is twofold. Our first, we want to assess the genomic connectivity within rusty blackbirds and identify independent demographic units. And if rusty blackbirds are spatially structured, evaluate how breeding populations are linked across the annual cycle using genetic signatures. So today I'm going to talk about our assessment of genetic structure across the breeding distribution to determine if structure is uh, sufficient um, to evaluate migratory connectivity. 
So we uh, collected reduced representation genomic data and mitochondrial sequence data, and then we analyzed it using four methods. So we did a principal components analysis to identify major trends in the distribution of genetic variation. We conducted a clustering analysis to test for the presence of multiple groupings. We also conducted a shared ancestry analysis to evaluate contemporary relationships. And finally, we calculated effective migration surfaces, and this identifies regions that deviate from a null model of isolation by distance. So blood samples from rusty blackbirds were uh, collected across the breeding distribution with several sites in Alaska showed by varying shades of blue. And then as you move east, we have the colors of the rainbow. So um, greens are for Western Canada, yellow for Central Canada, and orange, gray, and white in the east. So this is a mitochondrial DNA network, and this illustrates relationships among the sampled uh, haplotypes. So each circle represents a unique DNA sequence or haplotype, and the size of the circle is proportional to the number of individuals with that particular haplotype. So as you can see, there are two main haplotype groups, and then which suggests that rusty blackbirds were split into at least two refugia during the Pleistocene. This left group uh, contains more haplotypes that are rep represented by individuals from the eastern locales, and then this right group is predominantly represented by individuals sampled at Alaska and locales. So the maintenance of this east-west divide in the distribution of mitochondrial variation suggests that dispersal has continued to be restricted, but with this little bit of sharing that we're seeing suggests that there is some dispersal among sites. So we recovered a little over uh, 6,500 loci, uh, rad loci, and of those, approximately 6,200 were biparentally inherited and the remaining are sex-linked. And so for this talk, I'm only gonna present the results on the biparentally inherited loci, but the results from our sex-linked analyses were very similar. So I included a map to remind you of the sample locations and colors, and below we have a PCA plot and the numbers are an estimate of genetic structure. So with the PCA, there are four clusters present. We have Western North America, which contains Alaska, Yukon Territory, Alberta, and Manitoba. We have Central Canada, which is represented by Ontario, and then Northern Canada Maritime, which is Newfoundland. And then finally, Eastern North America, which is Nova Scotia, New Hampshire, and Vermont. And then when we uh, just looked at the Western North American locales, um, the Alaska sites, which are shown here, did break apart from the Western Canada sites. And these uh, partitions are reflected in the PHIST estimates. So PHIST is an estimate of genetic structure, which is similar to FST. These values range from zero to one, where zero indicates there's no structure, and one indicates that there is no genetic similarity between populations. And since we're analyzing over 6,000 loci, it's impossible to get a value of one for a within species comparison. So as you can see, although individuals within each population largely clustered together, estimates of genetic structure are lower. And when we looked at the mitochondrial DNA, these estimates were six to 10 times higher. And this is expected because this one is, uh, mtDNA is a single locus and the inheritance is only from the maternal line. So on the left are the results of our admixture analysis. So this is analysis assigns individuals into groups based on Hardy-Weinberg expectation. And we tested a range of possible groupings with the most likely number of groups given the data are two. And the samples from the East Coast in Alaska and Western Canada were assigned with high probability to unique clusters, which are shown in orange and blue. And Ontario had an intermediate placement on the PCA and is in place between the two main groupings in our admixture analysis. On the right, we have a co-ancestry matrix, which is based on nearest neighbor or first coalescence relationships and identifies individuals with indistinguishable genetic ancestry in the data set and then clusters them together into a population. Therefore, these relationships reflect relatively uh, recent evolutionary patterns. So the darker the color, the more genetically similar that individual pair is. So this bar along the side um, shows where, which locale the bird was sampled. 
and the co-ancestry analysis uncovered more subtle structuring with individuals clustering mainly by geographic proximity. So locales in Northeast North America had the highest shared co-ancestry values with samples being assigned to Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, and then Northeast United States. The uh, Ontario samples were assigned to their own population, but in agreement with the clustering analysis, it shared hierarchical ancestry with all the other groups and populations, indicating that connectivity um, to the Eastern and Western locales is going through Ontario. Samples from Western North America were primarily assigned to three main groups. We have Interior and Western Alaska, Anchorage, and then Western Canada, which is represented by Alberta and Manitoba. And unlike with the East Coast where population assignment was mutually exclusive, there is some mixture within the Western populations. So the landscape genomic analysis highlights where gene flow differs from expectations of isolation by distance. And the assumption is that as areas are more geographically distant, those regions should uh, exhibit increasing genetic differentiation. So this analysis identified regions of lower gene flow than expected under isolation by distance, which are shown in dark orange. So the regions with reduced gene flow are South Central Alaska, Yukon Territories, Alberta, West and East of Ontario, and then Northeastern uh, North America. And all these barriers had high posterior probabilities, except for this Western boundary in Ontario. And these boundaries roughly correspond to the population clustering analyses that we observed earlier. So rusty blackbird connectivity is restricted across their range, though adjacent populations do appear to be connected through a network of dispersal. And concordance in the patterns of genetic structure between maternally inherited mtDNA and biparentally inherited red loci suggest that dispersal tendencies are similar between the sexes. There is a strong east-west divide with Ontario intermediate between the two regions, and this is a common pattern in birds that have a boreal distribution. Um, there are subtle signatures of structure were uncovered among central and western locales. And then within the Atlantic region, there are greater levels of structure, and this may be coincident with the higher habitat loss associated with eastern North America relative to the more remote populations in the west. And Newfoundland is highly differentiated from the other maritime provinces and may represent a demographically independent unit. And this population also has subtle morphological differences which supports this inference of isolation. So since genetic structure was uncovered, we can move forward with our assessment of migratory connectivity. So shown here are uh, loci we selected that have elevated levels of structure among locations and are therefore useful for the assignment of individuals of unknown origin to breeding areas. So we're now in the process of getting samples from non-breeding areas so that we can determine how populations are linked across the annual cycle and identify areas that are important for conservation efforts, as well as areas that may identify causes of the decline. So with that, thank you all for listening. And if anyone is trapping rusty blackbirds during migration or winter, we're looking for blood or sample blood or feather samples for our project. So please either email me or Steve with any questions or if you want to coordinate with shipping. Or you can chat with us during our office hours, which are um, Friday, October 2nd from uh, 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern. All right. Thanks again.